I spent a holiday on this canal, an idyllic holiday, and I was so surprised to arrive here at this wharf that I was intrigued. I've now come back and I'm going to meet Owen Green from the Oxford Geology Trust who's going to tell me about this place. Amazing place. How does this come to be here? Um, well, Kirtlington Quarry was, um, they, were, they were first doing some, some work here in the um, early 1900s, but there has, or there is evidence that there was quarrying going on in this area um, a couple of centuries beforehand when they used to quarry um, the Fuller's Earth, which they used to use for cleaning and um, sheep's uh, um, fleeces. Uh, but this, um, the quarry here was actually um, the result of the, uh, the limestone industry and initially um, there was quarrying going on to um, take the limestone up to, or, or the processed lime up to um, Birmingham and Coventry via the canal. So hence that's why the quarry is right beside the canal. Um, quarrying was only was short-lived uh, uh, here, only, only for about 30 years. Um, by which time then the canals had been superseded by the railways and so quarrying moved to Shipton on Cherwell. But this particular quarry um, is, is important geologically um, because it allows us to see a part of, of the um, geological history of the British Isles which we can't see anywhere else. And that's this um, a, a sort of rocks exposed here from the Jurassic period um, they are very shallow water, marine rocks. Um, so shallow, in fact, that we get footprints in, in certain parts of, of this horizon. In fact, there's another quarry just over to the, um, to the east of us at Ardley, where there's a very famous dinosaur footprint uh, trail in there. Um, so that makes this a particular, you know, very important uh, uh, locality. So we were underwater then here in order to give us the, the, we, we, the animals that we have? We were definitely underwater here. Um, yes, there are marine fossils that uh, will, will be found and, and we'll, we'll see some later in the, uh, that come out of the rocks here. Uh, there, um, there's, there's also a range of rocks which if we went further to the west we would get typical oolites. But because we are, are further... Um, to, to the shore, uh, we see sort of plant material in some of the uh, um, um, samples which you get from over at a place called Stonesfield. Rocks of the same age, the famous Stonesfield slates, but they contain a lot of plant material. Um, here in, in, in this particular quarry, the fauna is dominated by a type of fossil called a brachiopod, and we will see examples see of them, uh, you know, when we, we look around at the rocks. Um, so yes, uh, over to the east from us, we had a land mass. Um, this was known as the, the London Brabant platform. So that was some high land. And then over to the west, we're going into slightly deeper water. Um, but it's still fairly shallow marine conditions. And that's where we get nice, well-developed um, oolites. So quarrying here obviously had an effect on what we see today, which is at, like an amphitheatre. Yeah. Did that have any effect on our appreciation of the fossils or our discovery of the fossils? Um, well, n not in initially. I mean, they were quarrying for the lime rock. Um, and so there, this was uh, an important um, industrial archaeological site in, in a way that there's still remnants of the, um, the, the rail track, the small narrow gauge rail track that ran through the quarry. Um, but they were, they, they, the quarrymen themselves weren't interested in the fossils, but of course geologists around that time were. And so they would often come and pay the geologists, uh, pay, pay the quarrymen to, to find the fossils and keep them for them. Um, the quarry itself was um, described in, in the late 1920s by a geologist who was working at Oxford University, William Arkell. 
and um, Arkell uh, visited the quarry and photographed it just after it had closed down in the 1920s so we still see nice clean rock faces and he could collect an awful lot of, um, of fossils from here both the, um, the, the, the faces that we'll see exposed behind us and also from the uh, spoil heaps which are, um, are in, in Washford pits just right near the canal and there are some lovely brachiopods to be found, found in there. They, they always say in archaeology you go looking for the, the rubbish pits. Evidently it's the same in geology, you look for um, the rubbish pits. It, it's, it certainly helps, yes, yes it does help. But of course as a geologist we really want to see the fossils in context. So we yes. do need a clean face and if clearly if, if, the, if the, the rocks are in situ um, as they were, were laid down and then the fossils are in situ, that means that we can actually um, help wor work out the, uh, the paleo-environmental conditions and the paleo-ecological conditions of the fauna that were actually living there at the time. So really the quarrying helped with what we can see today, but we wouldn't have wanted it to have gone on any longer. Oh, uh... <laughs> I, I, I'm sure that um, if, if people in the village now knew, knew that the, the, the owners of the quarry still had the quarrying rights, they would be a little bit um, upset if, if lorries started moving back <laughs> in here and big diggers were, were coming in here. Now, I know it's designated as an SSSI. It um, is. Tell me a little bit about that. OK, so the, the designation came around um, a few years ago when um, the, the geological importance of it, uh, in fact how, how it fits in with other Jurassic sites, middle Jurassic sites, which are about, you know, all, all have rocks of about 160 million years old. Um, so the, this particular site was seen to fit in in, in this, this geographical situation. And there, fortunately for us, there was a local geologist who lived in the village um, in, in Kirtlington, Stuart McCarrow. Now, um, Stuart realised that how important this site was. Um, it had been designated a triple SI, but it was very, very overgrown. So he managed to enlist the help of the Geologists Association and um, working with the, the um, Cherwell District Council and the owners of the site, who were, at that time were Blue Circle Cement, um, they then leased the site to, to the district council. Um, the GA then oversaw some, some clearance of some of the um, rock faces here so that we could actually see the geology. And, and Stuart ensured that this was um, known to the geological community so that its importance w would be maintained. Very important man then. He was a very important man and of course we've now named um, the, the trail that goes around through this, uh, uh, through the quarry and down by the canal. We call this the Macero Trail in, in his honour. Very fitting. Yeah, it is. places where we can actually have a look at the rocks in some detail. Right. Perhaps the most significant thing that, that uh, stands out is the fact that there are two very distinct units. There's this upper unit which is much more resistant than this lower unit down the bottom. And the upper unit you can actually see has got a predominantly flat bedded fabric and if you look very carefully, you'll see that some of these, these beds actually pinch out. So they appear to be like dunes, yeah. actually either going into the rock that way or you can see them along the, the strike of the rock. And it's actually quite a massive bed up here. This one is at least you know, half, a, half a metre thick. And then above it, we go into rocks which are not quite as hard. So the rock above and below have probably got more clay material in them which makes them less resistant but the unit below if we look very carefully and very closely at that you can see it's quite bobbly and that's because there's a bit that's broken off it's actually packed full of the little fossils now this was the horizon that they were quarrying this is the one that they were actually breaking down to get the lime out 
to, to make the cement. The unit above, um, uh, let's say it's a little bit harder, is, um, is from a, 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 a layer known as the forest marble. And these have all give, been given local names as well. So we get names like the Bladen Beds, the Ardley Formation. The unit below is packed full of the, these brachiopod fossils, and this is known as the Epithyrus limestone, because that's the name of the fossil that we find in there. If we look at it in a bit more detail under, um, under a microscope, um, we would actually see that there's, there's a lot more fossils in it. One of the things that you, you can see is that although there are fossils in here, they don't actually weather out because the fossils are made of the same composition as the, as the actual uh, rock itself. So it's a very fine um, sort of type of limestone known as a micrite. But the fossils can be extracted when you actually heat the rock. And that's, of course, what they were doing when they were actually processing it for, for, the, for the lime. And so we will find our best fossils in Washford pits over there. <laughs> and we'll grub around and, and, and hopefully find, find some. Uh, let me show you the close-up of some of the... This is the sediment from the forest marble. And if you look closely at that, you can see that there's a class of clay material in there. If you look closely at this surface, you'll see it's got lots of little rounded grains in it. These are known as oolics. These form oolitic limestones, most of which are nice clean oolitic limestones you actually find in the Cotswolds, um, where, where the, the rocks are just very simply dropped. And if you're using hand layers, have a look. You never go without a lens. See, there's some nice rounded grains in here, not, not in contact with each other. You'll be able to confirm it now. <laughs> so keep the lens close to your eye and then bring the rock up. So it's in focus. Yeah? And you can see the little ooliths in there. So these are grains which have been rolled around on the sea floor. And uh, when, when you look at them in thin section, they've all got little concentric layers inside them as they've picked up more and more micro. They've been rolled around in the tidal uh, conditions. So again, that's more evidence for this being both shallow water and near shore. down here in the summer and talked to Owen about the Kirtlington Quarry and learned that it's an SSSI, I pondered on this. I come back now on a rather blustery November day to meet Stuart Mabbott, who is the wildlife presenter for Radio Charwell. He should know about all the flora and fauna, so I'm off to see him and see what he can tell us. Good to see you here. I asked you to come because I've learned that this place is an SSSI yep. because of the geology. Yep. Now, it seems to me that if it's an SSSI, there's going to be some special flora and fauna here as well. And I reckon that you're the man that's going to tell me what we'll find. Yeah, indeed. Um, basically, it is an SSI because of the geology, but there has been lots of surveys done here, which backs up the importance of this site. Now that. <laughs> Along the Arctic Canal, there's a lot of interesting little habitats and they're all linked up by that canal, lots of little green corridors and this forms part of that. So that's part of the importance of this site, it's part of the wider community. Now it's a very mixed habitat and we need to keep it mixed because 
that's what keeps the dog diversity here. If one thing comes in and dominates, then uh, we're going to lose that diversity and the importance will be lost. Now, around you've got hawthorn, sycamore, oak, woodland, and then you've got an open floor around us. Now that's, that's, that's the important bit. Now what I want you to try and do in this piece is to get people to read the landscape they're in. They go for walks, but try and read the landscape. Now, with the woodland, if it's not managed, the sycamores and the oaks are going to dominate. The smaller things will, will die out. Now there's been a survey done here, relatively recently, right. of mosses. There's lots of different types of mosses in those woods. If it becomes too dense, some of those mosses will die out, but they're very host specific. Some mosses only grow on certain trees. There are also, in this open grass area, there is a whole nother set of mosses. So you can see, if this woodland encroaches into this grass area, there's a certain species of moss that are nationally rare that will be lost. Okay, there's also been a survey of wasps, bees and ants. And there are some nationally rare wasps and bees in this area. Well, what I want you to look at out in this grassed area, you, you were surrounded by man's impact, which is like the, the old quarry. But then you just take this for granted that this old spoil heaps, these little lumps. But these little lumps in the ground here with the dark tops, they're anthills. <laughs> they only get like this when the ground is completely undisturbed. It takes many generations for that to increase. So when you're walking across a piece of land, you know, you might be walking across a habitat. But there is one thing I want to draw people's attention to here. There are two habitats I pointed out, the grassland and the woodland. A key habitat in itself is that woodland edge. Between the two. Between the two. There are some creatures that only live in those edge habitats. So the whole thing is important, yes. not just the two halves. Yes. Now, you can have, you can increase that woodland edge habitat in one simple management technique. Tell me. It's very easy to just have a big curve uh, on woodland edge. But if you have like scallop shapes that cut into the, uh, the wood, you suddenly, you, you've gone from point A to point B, but you've possibly doubled that habitat by going in yeah. and out. Okay. Yeah. So it's the management <clears throat> as well. There are some orchids on this site. People go mad about orchids. But I, I don't necessarily think the orchids are, they're great, but they're only a small part of it. As soon as you get an orchid popping up, people start getting excited. <laughs> but then if that, if that gets people's enthusiasm, great. The one thing I would like to finish off on, on this is behind me here, we have a fire pit. Somebody, somebody's come out, probably with their kids, gone back to prehistoric times, lit a fire. I have made fire, fantastic. It's great if people have come out and enjoyed the countryside. But I've said there's mosses that are only growing in this open area. You have to be careful where you're lighting fires because you could light a fire the on the rarest plant. It's not about big things, small as well. So now we come across to the edge of the woodland where there's all sorts of things growing in the trees and and basically I just wanted to get you to look at what's on the ground. There are a whole range of things that are growing on this woodland edge that aren't growing into the wood and aren't growing out here. There's, there's um, ground ivy, there's actually some uh, ground uh, miniature strawberries, there's some little dead metal. But, you know, you get this uh, old man's beard up here. But there's just things that grow in different places and you can begin to see the scallops I was talking about along here. But there's something I want to show you, is down here. I often say conservation is the maintenance of different levels of decay. Now this is dead wood from the hawthorn that uh, is growing above. Now you can go very wrong with dead wood. The insects on living plants are very host specific. The insects on dead wood are host specific. So say for example, you've got huge amounts of hawthorn growing, there's no point bringing in huge amounts of dead wood from beach woodland because the things aren't going to be in the area to attract. There's also different mosses 
growing that will only grow on dead wood off hawthorn. If it's living, it's not going to grow on it. So we need to keep this stuff as well. But our, the most important thing of what this film is going to talk about here is I pulled this out from the undergrowth. It's got to go exactly where I picked it up from because these things are very specific to the sites and the locations as well. So if I go and put this out into the open sunshine, everything that's alive on this will probably die in itself. So I'm going to put it back. You've got it on film, so hopefully it will go back there. Well. So I think it was about there. <laughs> so I don't know if people just think about it, they can relate this back to their own gardens and just replicate it and bring a bit more wildlife into their own garden. Thanks ever so much.